hi there in part 18 we are gonna add the remaining stats and after adding the remaining stats one of the things that we'll be doing right is we will be making a ui element that is gonna be very adaptive So we're gonna add a couple a couple of new stats and these stats are going to be armor, max health, area, duration, amount, cooldown, luck, growth, greed, curse, and revival. We are also gonna restructure the stats. Struct a little bit. This is just to make the whole thing easier to use. So this part should be pretty simple, pretty quick as well. So all these new stats here, I'm just gonna copy and paste them. So, there are a couple of things that I have to go through over here. First thing is, before we talk about the attributes over here, right? I want to talk about the constructor over here. So this constructor exists because previously, right, when we had when we had just 6 stats, what the constructor was there to do was to make it so that we are able to create a default set of values for the stats that we have here. So what this does is that when I create a new character data object, we have default values filled up for the stats value over here because once we create a constructor for the struct when we declare the variable itself we're able to just create a new copy a default value for for all of these so if you look at this constructor here new stats i only put a 1000 here for the health but then you'll see the other variables here have values as well but the constructor is also a bit cumbersome because if you were to add the stats manually you will see that every time you add a stat here you will have to update the constructor to populate the stat as well and then you might be wondering now because we don't have a constructor right it will not be possible for us to populate the stat to the default value so by adding the new stats and removing the constructor you will see that of course there are more stats now but then things become a little bit harder to use and the reason for that is because now everything all the stats are zero and you know when you're creating characters uh, assets and everything right to set the values manually takes a little bit of work so we want to take the amount of work that we have to do away so but without the constructor how can we set default values okay so the other way to set default values is to basically use something called an object initializer by using this object initializer we still have a way to set default values for all of the stats inside here so the the constructor is really not needed which is why we are removing it so we are adding the new stats into the stat struct and then we are updating the initializer to set default values for all of our stats when we create a new character data object. So over here in this function, this is the function that, de that determines how the values will interact when we put two stat objects together. And it's just adding the values together, right? It's pretty straightforward. So whatever new stats that we have, we also have to update the plus operator to add the new values inside our code. So for all the new stats that we add, we have to make sure that it's accounted for in the plus operator. And then we also got to make sure that it's accountable in the objects initialized. So once we do something like that, you will see that when we create a new character data asset, because the object initializer is there, we will be able to have default value set for some of the stats over here. So that's about it for adding the new stats. So one thing that we that, that I want to talk about as well is you will see in the variables that we define, right? We have these little square brackets over here. The range attribute is an attribute that is attached to numeric variables like floats or integers. And what the range value does is that it allows us to limit the range of a particular variable to a certain range. So for example, here the move speed here, right? The range of fit is minus 1 to 10. So what this means is that when I head over to the inspector and I adjust the move speed, I can only adjust it between minus 1 to 10. Even if I try and increase it above 10, you will see that it's automatically kept 10. So even though none of the stats or very few of the stats can go negative, you want to be able to reduce the value of the stat. Recall that or rather be aware that the stats object here is not just used to represent the player stats. It's also used to represent stat changes, which is why we have to have negative and positive values. And then for the for the luck, growth, greed, and curse stats, I've put a minimum minus one attribute instead of a range attribute. What this does is that this limits the minimum value that these stats can have. So for example, the luck stat can go to minus one, but it cannot go any further. It can go as high as you want, but it cannot go lower than minus one. All of these uh, percentage based boosts so you really shouldn't have to have a reduction of more than minus one whenever you use them okay so 
the reason I added these attributes, number one is to make the inspector look better. Number two is, is to identify all of the stats that are percentage based. Okay, but we'll get to that later. So now that we have updated the stats, you will see that in all your passive items, scriptable objects, in all of your character data, scriptable objects, as well as in your player stats, there will be a lot more stats you can play around with. Again, the player stats, you have base stats and you have actual stats. Actual stats are calculated stats. And they are recalculated every time you receive a passive item. It's just a recap of part 15, alright? So now that we have added these new stats, right? The next thing we have to do is we have to... If you recall in the player stats script, right? Because previously the stats of the player were tied to the player stats script. Okay, so we gotta hit in there and if you hit in there, you will find that there are a whole bunch of getters and setters for stats. Okay, th these are for the old system. And previously, we didn't remove it because we were revamping the whole thing in part 15, right? And then the revamp involved so many things, you know, we were creating new weapons, new passives, new evolution systems and everything, right? So if I remove all of these references to the old stats, okay, you will find that a whole bunch of errors will pop up. This is because the references to these stats are used by other scripts. So by, dele by deleting them, this will cause other scripts to break and I didn't want to make part 15 any longer at the time. Let's remove all the references to the old stats. Okay, just a recap of what the old stats did, alright? In the old system, the stats were stored explicitly inside player stats, which has its limitations, which is why we moved to the new system. Okay, but the old system, what it does was that all these stats actually were represented by actual variables inside the player stats. Uh, in part 15, we replaced that by making it reference our actual stats instead. So even if you use these getters and setters, you will still be setting the actual stats value inside player stats. Besides that, it doesn't really do anything different from... It's just getting a value and setting a value, right? But one thing that it does is that it updates the UI in the game manager. Okay, so when you press escape and pause the game, the stats will show up. So whenever you update the max health, you update the recovery or any of the old stats, right? It will update the UI inside the game manager, okay? So we are going to replace that UI with something new, with something very ad adaptive and something that once we create once, we can reuse it for all of our UI screens. So if you remove all, all of the old getters and setters for old stats, be sure to leave current health alone because current health is not represented by, by our stats, okay? So if you see, our stats here only has max health and then the player stats still has to track the current health of the player. So current health is, is the only setter that we're gonna leave untouched right here. Okay, so the rest of the getters and setters, you remove them and then there will be a bunch of errors that occur. Some of these refer to scripts that are not there anymore. Let's just fix all the errors that you see with player stats, alright? So under player stats over here, you will see that once you remove those variables, there are some errors because there are scripts that reference these variables, okay? So for example, current recovery. So you will see all the variables are actually here, okay? So just remove all of these. Okay, I'm going to remove the health one as well because we don't have to display the health anymore. Later on, we will just do it in the UI itself, okay? So I'm just going to remove this whole chunk over here and then this fixes my errors. So in the player stats script right we have the option to either use actual stats or to use the stats objects so we we remove those we set the new stats getter and setter and then we just go to all our scripts that refer to the old set values and then replace them with the new stats value all right and this will fix all of our issues with the stats Okay, one thing you'll find in player stats is that under the current health, we update the current health uh, display, which we don't have to do anymore because we've, re we've replaced that with a new UI stat box, right? Okay, so what we want to do instead is that whenever we update the current health, we just want to update the health bar. Okay, let me, let me just explain to you why the health bar goes here, okay? Okay, if you look at how the health bar is updated currently in our game, right? Okay, this is covered in the previous part. You have restore health, you have recover, and then you have take damage. All of the three functions will modify the current health. Okay, so instead of putting them in three different spots, we just put them directly inside current health, inside the setter, so that now whenever the health modifies, the health bar will update. Okay, in the previous part, we fixed the bug regarding the health bar not updating when we did a pickup. Right? Okay, so this is a better fix than what we did in part 17. So the rest of the errors are pertaining to scripts that we no longer use. So we have two options we can do. We can update the scripts over here, or we can just delete all of our obsolete scripts and 
I'm gonna opt for deleting the scripts because the scripts are no longer used, right? So anyway, I very neatly filed them into obsolete folders. So I'm just gonna delete all of these scripts. Okay, the prefabs are not compulsory to delete. You can just leave them there, but it's just gonna take up more space in your project. So it's up to you if you wanna find them out and delete them. After we remove all the obsolete stuff, we can actually scroll all the way down and you will see that under player stats, there are two obsolete functions as well. So because we've deleted all the obsolete scripts, we no longer need to keep the obsolete spawn weapon and spawn passive item functions. Okay, so once you delete everything that you need to delete, you will find that the console works and you should be able to run your game normally. And everything should still function properly. Okay, before we create the new UI, what I forgot about was to readjust the health scaling. So for some reason, in our old scriptable objects and whatnot, right? You'll find that all of our players have 1000 health, which makes the scaling of our, um, our health a little bit weird. So what I'm gonna do is to reduce the health of all my characters to 100. Just a small change, but it makes the entire project easy to manage, at least in my opinion. So in the project files, you will find that the health of the character is reduced to 100 as well. To complement that, we will have to go to the enemies as well and reduce the damage the enemies do. Otherwise, you're gonna die in like 3 bites because now you have 100 health. And finally, we have to go to the health potion and then we have to reduce the number of the amount of health that the health potion gives. Instead of 500, it's gonna give us 50 now. Okay, just to reduce the scaling of the health to make it easier to manage. Okay, with that, we are done with adding new stats. Okay, pretty simple, right? So if you are creating your own game and you want to add, want to add more stats, just give it a stat. All right, just add a new variable. Inside the character data stats, struct, and then you should be able to work with the stat inside the player stats, inside, inside the passive scriptable object, and inside the character data scriptable object. Okay, next thing you want to do is, uh, let, let me just pull up the pause screen for you. When we play the game, the stats will display all here, which is great, but Notice that whenever we add a new stat, we have to redesign the stat display, right? Which is troublesome, right? This thing here. If you recall just now in player stats, right, we had we had a whole bunch of code that we removed. And the code that we removed was all the setters and everything, right? The reason why Xavier made the setters inside the player stats was because he wanted the setters to also update the UI, which is right here. If we do it this way, every time we create a new stat, we will have to code the UI functionality, to code the UI update and everything, right? which is something that we don't want. Okay, so let's delete them. Okay, and as for creating the new, the new UI elements, okay, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to start with... Okay, let, let me just hide the current stats display. Okay, and then I'm just going to create a new image like this. And this image here is going to be, I'm just going to call this UI stats display. UI stats display. From here, I am going to set the sprite of this UI stats display to use the, the border that we have for the rest of our buttons as well. So I'm just going to grab this border and drop it inside here. So this gives us a nice border. And let me just stretch this border out to say 250 by 250 and then once we're inside here i'm gonna create two text objects okay so if you're using text mesh pro you can use text mesh pro otherwise text objects are fine as well just gotta update the code if you're using regular text because in our code okay we recommend just to make things easy you recommend that you use text mesh pro as well instead of using the text system because the text system in unity is depreciated is deprecated which means that it's going to be replaced with text mesh pro in the future so if you download later versions of unity you will see that there is no text component there is only text mesh pro so i'm gonna create a new text element here this will be called stat names and i am going to stretch the element to cover the entire object so how do you do that you click on this over here and then you hold alternate and then you press stretch what this does is this will force the, the text element to stretch and cover the entire box so later what we're gonna do is we're gonna list all the stat names over here so for example max health recovery what else move speed my duration cooldown and so on right so i'm just listing some some of the stats over here just for reference i'm stretching this whole thing inside here because what i want to do right is i want to set an auto size feature for the text so notice that once i set the auto size over here you will see that the text itself you see it resizes to fit inside the box and i'm gonna decrease the minimum and increase the maximum so that this is maximally adapted okay no matter what box i put it in it's always going to try and fit the text into the appropriate size, okay, which is super convenient. So just check auto size 
and then just reduce the minimum and increase the maximum. So the next thing we want to do, right, is we want to adjust the box so that it takes up half of the screen. Something like this. Okay, so I'm going to adjust the box like this so that it takes up about 50% of the screen. But I not only want to do that, I also want to adjust the anchor of the box to be 50%. So what I'm going to do here is instead of moving and resizing the box, the box manually, I'm going to select my... I'm going to set the anchor over here to 0.5 for the X. So you will see this will move the anchors over here. So I'll set this to 0.5, I'll set the right to 0. And what this does is this makes my box cover exactly half the screen. If I resize the box, you will see that the text will change as well. This is the parent, all right? Okay, so I'm going to the child, I'm spitting the anchor and making the anchor go to the top left, top right corner as well as the middle. I also want to add a little border because you see the text here is actually going onto the borders okay so i'm just gonna select my stat names object again and then set the left to say 10 and then top 10 right is zero right because right you just want to be at the edge and then bottom 10 so once you add a little bit of a border you will see everything looks better what you want to do is just to make sure the text box doesn't touch the borders but otherwise you want it to populate exactly 50 percent of the box and then for the other line, we will create one more text element and we will do the same thing but we align it to the right instead. So over here, same thing, we set auto size and then we set the same values that we set for the left hand side. Okay, these will be called the stat values. So make sure that it's parented to UI stats display, right? It's not parented to the stat names object. So then again, I'll, I'm going to stretch this thing. But then next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to move the anchor to cover the other half of the screen. And then I'm just gonna key in a couple of values, just a couple of filler values to match the stat to the name, right? So it just has to match the number of lines on the left hand side. Uh, last thing I wanna do is to align the text to the right. And you'll see we have a stat box over here, right? It's really working. If you resize the parent, you will see the text will always fit. Once we get this set up, notice that we can just prefab this, we can put this anywhere, we can display stats using this, right? It's super convenient. What I'm gonna do as well is you'll see the border is really large. Again, UI stats display image component, set the pixels per, per unit multiplier to two, and then this will make the border a lot cleaner. And then I can perhaps reduce the margin on the left side over here, and on the right side over here, and then Again, we have a resizable window. Okay, that's only half the battle, right? The other half of the battle is to actually create a script that will automatically populate the values here for us. Before that, uh, I'm actually going to create a new UI folder and I'll put the script inside here. As, as we develop more features in the game, right? I'm always going to be creating prefabs for our UI. So we want to create reusable modular components. Okay, we're aiming to do that so that it reduces the amount of modifications we have to do in different parts of our code as we add more features. So I'm going to create a new script here called UI Stats Display. And this UI Stats Display script, you will just attach it to the UI Stats Display game object right here. Okay, so what this script is going to contain, it's going to contain logic for automatically reading the stats from the character data stats struct. I'll grab the code from here and I'll explain to you what's going on in the code, right? Okay, so what I designed the UI stat display script to do is I I, I've designed it to receive a player stats object. This is the player that the window is reading stats from. So one thing that this allows us to do in the future as well, if you want to code multiplayer features, you can have multiple UI stat displays for different characters. So for now, we only have one player, but we just got to assign the player over here. And then this will allow the UI stat display object to read from the player that we have over here. Okay. What's happening in the script here is it basically has two objects, stat name, stat values, right? This correspond to stat name, stat value, okay? But we are not assigning this manually, okay? We want to automate the whole thing, right? So this is actually done inside the code itself. So what the code does is that it actually just has on enable. This is the most important function for this particular piece of script. What the on enable function does is that, you know, our pause screen, it turns on, turns off, right? So whenever we turn on the stat display, we want to update the stats. So then this means that we don't have to track whenever we update our stats, then we want to update the UI stat display as well. Automatically, whenever the UI stat display is turned on, it will look for the player. It will read the player stats and update the values. So the reading of the player stats is inside update stat fields over here. Okay, and then there are two parts to update stats view. It, it has two jobs. Okay, the first job is it updates the stat names, which is this object over here. Second thing it does is updates the stat values over here. Okay, so first, what this code does is that uh, if there is no player, it returns, right? 
Simple as that. So if you forget to assign a player to the script over here, you forget to assign the player, then the script just won't work. Okay, but if you assign a player, then what it's gonna do is gonna find child object. So you will see this UI stats display here has two children. It's gonna find children number zero and then assign it as stat names. Children number number one will be assigned stat values. And then from there, what it does is that once you get the two text objects, we are going to build the strings. So if you notice that for the left hand side, for example, this whole thing is a string. So we have to build the string, which is just a list of all the stats that we have. And then we're going to build a list of strings, which is just a list of all the stat values that we have. Okay, so we create two string builders. I'll explain what string builders are later. Okay, and then we find... Okay, this is the actually the money maker over here. Okay, this is the piece of code. We will be using something called reflection. Reflection basically is just reading data from a class. Okay, so if you recall inside our player... Sorry, inside our character data script, we have a stat struct, right? Inside the stat struct, we have some variables over here. It's possible to use code to read all of these variables. Okay, and that's exactly what I'm doing when I'm using this thing over here. So, these are called fields. Okay, so I'm retrieving the field info of all the fields inside the struct called character data dot stats. Alright, inside character data, there is a struct called stats. And then from there, I want to get all the fields that are public and that are attached to an instance. Okay, this means that these are not fields, these will not be static. So for example, if I were to add, let's say, if I were to make this static, then the fields will be retrieved. Okay, so if I retrieve instance fields, this means that they are not static. If I retrieve public fields, this means that, well, of course, they are labeled public. So I'm getting all the fields that are labeled public and they are not static inside the character data stats struct. And what do you know? There's only these. So these are all the variables that I retrieve. So once I retrieve them, I'll do a loop. Okay, when I loop through all of these variables, I'll just grab the name of the variable and then just add them to the names string builder. And then after, I, after I'm done doing that, I will find the field. So that whatever that you find inside the field here, it corresponds to the variable inside player stats. Okay, because same thing, right? They're the same kind of object. So then here I'm getting the, the value of whatever stats that we are checking on the player and then we are adding the value of that to the player character. So what this essentially does is that it just reads the character data stats struct and it reads the actual stats, one of the values inside and then it just displays everything onto the UI window. Okay, so let me just pause the game and you will see all the stats are appearing, right? And notice that these are all the variable names, right? See that? Max health, recovery, armor, whatever, whatever. And then wherever there is a value, the value will be here. So there are two things that we want to do over here. Uh, let's refer to Vampire Survivors' UI interface again. Obviously, Vampire Survivors, their stat display is prettier. Okay, and that is because firstly, Okay, you will see that inside Vampire Survivors, some of the stats are percentage based. So remember that we, in the character data script, we labeled some of the stats as range or as minimum, right? So this is when we utilize these. Okay, all of these are percentage based values. Okay, if you check the stats page inside Vampire Survivors, you will find the same thing. All of these stats are labeled as percentage based. So we will want to add some functionality into our code to check whether there's an attribute attached to these variables. Okay, and if there are attributes attached to them, then we will treat them as percentage values instead of treating them as flat values. Okay, this will make the display look something like this. So next thing we want to do is add percentage values. Okay, so this is how we want the percentages to work. Okay, so we want the percentages to be as follows. With percentage based values, right? Uh, so for example, let's say if we have a stat that increases, let's say the might stat increases our damage, right? Okay, so by default, the might stat will be 100%. Why? Because you're dealing 100% of the damage that you have, right? Okay, so if the might stat is at 1, the display percentage will actually be 0% because there's no addition, right? So if I get a 25% boost to my might, or let's say we get a 50% boost. My mindset is actually going to be 1.5. That's a 50% boost, okay? If it's a reduction, let's say 25% reduction, my mindset will be 0 0.75. Okay, so for mindset of let's say 1.5, this will be plus 50%. Okay, we also want to round down the stat. 
So this will be 50.043 bonus, but then it's rounded down to 50% because decimal places make everything look messy, right? Plus, if if you if you get a odd situation when you divide by 3 or divide by 6, then you'll get very long numbers. Okay, so we want to round down or round up, depend round round to the nearest whole number for our percentages. Okay, so 1.5 will be 50%, 2.00 will be 101%. Here it's rounded up because it's a uh, 100.75. And then again, if it's below one, then we want to have display a uh, minus 25%, 50%, 100%, whatever. So for our stat, right, if it's a percentage value, we will have to apply the following formula. Take the value, you times 100, and then you minus 100. So with this formula, what we want to do is just to integrate this formula into our code. So currently what our code does is it just gets the raw value and after that it checks whether the value is an integer, if it's an integer you convert it to an integer, otherwise you convert it to a float. And then you add the value to the to the string builder. Okay, and uh, what is this slash n over here? This slash n over here stands for new line. Okay, so when we add the name we append the line, but because over here we're using a raw append. For example, if you have uh, all the stats like move speed, then I press enter and then uh, max health. And then enter and everything right so there are two ways to add this enter one way is to use the append line function the other way is to add the value and then do a slash n in the back so we have to modify this a little bit instead of just adding the value right away after we check for the value we will check for some other other things so if we check and we get the value and we convert it to either a float or an integer next thing you want to do is to we're just checking whether the few that we have has something like this or like this okay it doesn't have to be range or minimum as long as it has an attribute then it will be considered as a percentage based value so if there is an attribute for the variable and then if the field is a float okay because if it's an integer you can't really apply percentages to it right okay so what we're doing here is we're just this this thing over here is just a formula that we saw right here okay so i'm just applying this formula to the value that we have that we retrieve from the variable whatever times 100 then minus 100 you round it to the nearest whole number so we check whether the percentage is zero zero is dash if it's more than zero it's a plus otherwise it's a minus and then we append because we have the plus and minus right and after that we add the value over here the percentage sign and then the new line so notice also that all these characters over here these are single quote characters these are not strings these are characters so if it's a if it's a percentage based value, we will turn this into a percentage, display a plus or minus behind. And then after that, display a percentage, and then of course that's the value. Otherwise we will just apply whatever the value is into the string builder. Okay, and finally once we are done, we will just put out the names and the values, the, the, the string, right? So we've we've got to assign them to the text mesh pro for them to display. So once you construct the string, you can put them into the text mesh pro element and then we can display the string okay let's play the game and then let's pause the game and we will see the stats okay so now you'll see most people for example has a percentage so if i were to just adjust the values accordingly like that and i unpause and pause you will see just they are different so how do we pre predefy the name of the stats so our variables are actually if you look at the variables we have in the inspector they are camel case right or rather, the variables we have in C sharp that camel case, all right? So, for example, stat names over here, stat small letter, and then whenever there's a new word, there's capital letter over here. So, whatever that's camel case in the inspector, it actually turns into regular spelling. So, we want the same thing to happen for our stats inside the character data stat struct. Okay, so we have to apply with the create function that helps us to process the string and then convert the camel case characters. Camel case again is just a format like this into actual words okay so the function is in the article itself as well and the function is predefy names okay what predefy names does is basically it just loops through okay it takes a string builder input okay this is because we are building our string using a string builder so we have a string builder over here and what we are doing is we are looping through the string builder right to access all of the characters inside the string let's break down what a string is all right a string is just a bunch of characters okay so for example this is a string and then this string has how many characters 11 characters all right so you can think of every string as an array as well okay so for example this is a string or this is an array of 11 
characters. Okay, string builders treat everything inside the string as a character. Okay, whatever comes in the string builder, okay, we will look through it. Okay, and we will check whether the last character. So when we are looking through, we will always record the last character that we check. Okay, and stash zero means there's no character. Okay, this stands for null character or no character. Okay. So what we want to do is whatever step we have, right? We have a rule that we want to abide by when, when it comes to processing our stats. So whenever we look through a stat, we want the first character to always be uppercase. And then we will just check through everything. And then wherever there's uppercase character, we will add a space behind. That's what we want to do. In this loop, this is exactly what we are doing. Okay, we are looping through, we're checking for the character. If the character is the first character, we will make it uppercase. Otherwise, if the character has a white space before, then we will also make it uppercase. Okay, this is just in case, you know, you have stuff like max health. Then this will actually convert this to uppercase as well. So the reason why we check for white space is because, again, uh, we are actually checking for a whole bunch of characters. So this whole thing here, right, when we process the string, this whole thing is one string. Okay, so this will be a white space as well. So we are checking if the first character or if there's a white space over here, this will be capitalized, capitalized. So this means that if, if the character is really uppercase, we will add a space before before we add the character in. Over here we have a string with a result, this is just a resulting string. Okay, so every character that we have, we will add it to the result. But before we add to the result, we may make the character uppercase or we may add a space before the result. Okay, so once we go through this entire loop, we will end up with a result that is equivalent to a pretty fine string of names. So once we are done with that, we will just have to go to stat names text over here and then instead of doing this, we will just do a pretty fine name and then we will just put it inside here. So notice that this function is also static so that you don't need to so that you can use this function anywhere else inside your code. So once we have the pretty fine names over here, this will make our stat names now look pretty like that. So the last thing you want to do is to apply a couple of quality of life additions. Okay, so first is I'm gonna add a on draw gizmo selected here like that. What this does is that this function will fire whenever we select the object in the editor. Okay, and what I'm gonna do here is on draw gizmo selected, I'm gonna first add a public boolean update in editor. What update in editor does is that it's just gonna be false. Okay, I'm gonna show you how it works later. Okay, so on draw gizmo selected, I'll check if update in editor is true. If it is true, what I'm gonna do is call update stat fields. Update in editor. All right, I'm gonna deselect this, and then do you see that updated itself? So then, if I empty this out, for example, right? Okay, so if I select this object, automatically the stats will fill up. Okay, this is if I set update in editor to be true. Okay, and this is powered by basically just me calling the function update stat fields inside on draw is more selected. Then whenever I select the object, then the stat fields will update. Okay, the last thing I want to add is to just add a reset function right here. So over here. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna just automatically set the player find object of type player stats. This reset function actually fires whenever we add a new copy of the display stat display. So for example, if I remove this and I add the UI stat display again, what it does is automatically you'll try and find a relevant player character and put it inside here. Okay, so this is just a small piece of code to make make it so that you know your code doesn't bug out you don't get a null reference or something because if you if you leave out this player object then the stat display is not going to work right so we want to make it so that if you attach the component automatically it tries to find a player for you you know it just helps you avoid errors what i like to do with ui elements is like usually i like to position them in the screen and then i like to split my anchor like this so that it's right at the corner of my ui object so when I do something like this and I split the anchor, you will see that if I resize the screen, right? You will see that the window will change itself. Okay, so this makes the whole thing responsive. The last thing that I'm going to be working on is to... It's, it's pretty boring actually, because the last thing is just to implement the stats. Okay, so we have added a whole bunch of stats, right? So now we have to add the stats <clears throat> because different stats affect different parts of the game, right? So we have to add these stats into our game and the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna work on is the move speed stat 
you'll see this move speed over here is 400%. This is because the move speed stat, right? Actually, it's actually programmed to take a static value. So the move speed is just the number of meters that you travel in one second. Uh, it's little grids so over here, one meter is just one square. The move speed stat, because it's a float, and in, in the game itself as well, right? You will find that in the game, the move speed is, is a percentage based value. So we've got to change this a little bit, and how do we do that? We go to player movement over here, and you will see that the move speed here right now, it takes move speed as though it's a flat value. Okay, we can't do that. Move speed over here, it's now become a percentage based value. Now we're gonna just going to define the default move speed as 5, and then we're going to just multiply this value. Okay, so what is a constant? A constant basically makes it so that this value can be accessed anywhere in the code. Okay, anywhere in the code that you want, you can just do player movement dot uh, default move speed and then this will give you the move speed of the of, of all the characters and then I'm just gonna move all the way down to the move function over here and okay instead of doing the same operation two times on the x and the y value I'll just grab the vector multiply it by move speed and multiply it by the scalar the, the percentage value over here okay vectors can be multiplied with by numbers okay it's just a optimization for the expression nothing much otherwise just add the default move speed here and then now we are able to go to the character data and we can reduce the move speed to 1. Okay, because 100% right? Well now we have to change wings so that it adds only 0 0.1 because now it's percentage based. Okay, it's no longer flat value based. So everything will be 0 0.1 for the wings instead of uh, 1 which is 10% increase. Okay, it's still the same thing it's just we gotta readjust the values because we are readjusting the way that the speed set or rather the move speed set has been calculated. Then we have to go to armor stat. Armor stat is the most interesting one to implement because we will have to head into the take damage function right here. So what we are doing here is before we deal damage, we will just take the damage over here and then we reduce it by the armor of the player character. Simple as that. So once it's done, you just check if the damage is more than zero. Okay, why do we check whether damage is more than zero? Because if the armor reduces damage to less than zero, then your your damage will start healing your character. Because if you get health minus and then minus damage, this will actually become a plus. Okay, so you have to check whether the damage is more than zero. Only then then you deal damage to the player. Otherwise, you will heal the player with the enemy's damage. And then over here, we have a damage effect here. This is something that we did in part 15, right? Just a little blood effect that we have. Okay, and then we have this thing here, this invincibility timer. What this does is that this prevents the player character from taking damage. <clears throat> Whenever the player takes damage, whether it's blocked or not, we want the player to become invincible for a short duration. And that's really about it. It's just a, just a quick reorganization of of our code. Okay, we just want to add one extra thing that's not in Vampire Survivors, which is uh, good feedback. Because in Vampire Survivors, if you're not taking damage, actually it's pretty hard to tell, right? Because there's no special effect that appears. So what I want to do is actually to create a special effect to show when you are not taking damage. Okay, so let's add a new particle effect as well. And let's call this blocked effect. So I'm going to add a header, visuals. And then over here, damage effect, I will duplicate this, and then this will be block effect. Okay, so what this does is that if the damage is completely blocked by armor, then you play a different... Doesn't make sense, right, for you to have blood when you take no damage. So then we're just gonna create a different special effect for that. So we have just implemented armor. The next step that we want to implement is the projectile speed step. For that, we will have to make a couple of modifications. The main modification really is just inside the projectile script. We just add a little modification to it right here. So just to multiply whatever the projectile velocity is by the set of the owner. And because the projectile has two modes of movement, right? depending on what you set the rigid body of the projectile too. We have to modify we have to add the formula over here and we have to also 
add the multiply over here. Projectile script is basically calculating what its speed should be and it's calculating it by taking the stats of the weapon and then multiplied by the owner's uh, any projectile multiplier stats that the owner has that to the player right it has to go through the weapon to get to the player this means that we need to have a way for the projectile to access the weapon and for now if you look at the weapon the item is actually a parent class of the weapon right so all weapons are items all right so in the item class there is owner variable and this owner variable is what we want to access to access our projectile speed step because it's protected though we have to expose it using a getter so that the projectile is able to get access to the player stats script so let's head over to the item script okay we have this variable we want to access so we just are gonna do this public player stats owner and then this will just give us uh, the owner variable and once we have this we will be able to go to the projectile script and get the weapon that the projectile belongs to and then from the weapon we can get to the owner of the weapon and then from the owner of the weapon we can get to the stats okay so we have to move this multiplier over to the fixed update function as well where we have to add this multiplier to the speed so basically our projectile weapon it, it functions differently depending on whether the rigid body attached to it is a kinematic or whether it is a dynamic if it's kinematic the projectile script will take over and will start moving the projectile if it's a dynamic rigid body then it will just set the velocity and let the projectile just fly around by itself so if you're not sure what the difference between a kinematic and a dynamic rigid body is you can refer to one of our articles again it's all linked in part 15 so you can just refer to part 15 and everything will be explained in further detail over there this allows us to implement the projectile speed stat so it's just two changes one change to the item script and then two lines of changes to the projectile script and then this will factor in the owner's speed stat when it comes to the projectile speed of the weapon later we'll test everything together to ensure that uh, everything works okay for the amount stat we will have to go to the weapon script and under the weapon script you will see that under the under the update function right whenever the weapon is cooled down then an attack will fire the attack will fire based on how many times the weapon will fire so current stats is the weapon stats and then if the weapons number stat currently is three for example it fires three projectile okay so it will call attack and then pass an argument of three so what we want to do is just to add a new argument over here so this will take the number of projectiles the weapon is currently firing and then add the amount stat that the owner has and this will increase the stats of the weapon accordingly so I'm, I'm going to get a weapon that has projectiles okay so the amount stat if you increase it it increases the amount of projectiles that you have so pretty nice okay so there we go so that's the amount stat so we have one more stat and the last stat is cooldown so for the cooldown stat it's going to be relatively complicated because for the cooldown stat right the current cooldown is the variable that is tracking how, how much cooldown is left and then the of course this is the cooldown of the weapon so whenever the stat cools down you will add the cooldown to the current cooldown and then the current cooldown will count up to zero and the weapon fires what we are doing is that previously we always use the plus sign plus equals to to add the weapon's cooldown to the current cooldown we do this instead of just setting the current cooldown equals to the weapon's cooldown because when we add the cooldown this makes our cooldown tracking more precise because if we were to just assign it's possible that the current cooldown can sometimes reduce slightly below zero the reason for that is because let's take for example right that a spell has a cooldown of 0 0.1 seconds and then every frame in the game takes let's say 0 0.03 seconds to complete so if we have a cooldown of 0 0.1 seconds this means that when the spell finishes cooling down the value of current cooldown will be equal to 0 0.02 okay so if we set the cooldown back to 0 0.1 after that then the that means that the spell would have in actuality taken 0 0.12 seconds to cool down which is not what we want it's a small it's just a small difference right but it adds up over time so what we want to do is we want our weapon to be very precise so then this means that if we added the cooldown right with a minus 0.02 if you add the cooldown let's say 0.1 back here this will give us 0.08 okay but using addition has its own problems because if you 
reset the cooldown multiple times by active then the cooldown suddenly will become two times as long or three times as long. So we have a, we're gonna create a new activate function, activate cooldown function right here. And we're gonna drop it into the weapon script. And then I'm gonna explain what this function does. Okay, so activate cooldown, what it does is that it's all in the comments actually, so it's pretty easy to read. It has an optional parameter called strict. Okay, so if you set strict to true, this means that the cooldown can only be activated when the current cooldown is less than zero. Okay, otherwise it's just gonna reset. This actual cooldown is basically us calculating what the cooldown is going to be. So this is the weapon's cooldown multiplied by any stat bonuses that the owner has. So for example, if the owner has a level 3 empty tube, this is gonna be minus 0 0.24, 24% decrease, right? So this is gonna be minus 0 0.24 and then this is gonna be 7, 0 0.76. So then we will just take the current cooldown, multiply it and multiply it by 0 0.76 to reduce the cooldown. And then this will be the actual cooldown of the weapon. Okay, here we are getting the current cooldown and then we're adding the actual cooldown. This means that if I were to reset this weapon's cooldown multiple times, it's never gonna increase above the maximum cooldown. So for example, if my maximum cooldown or my actual cooldown is, let's say, 6 seconds. By doing this, okay, if current cooldown is less than 0, this will give me a value that is less than actual cooldown. But if my current cooldown is more than 0, then this will give me a value that is actually more than actual cooldown, and we don't want that to happen. So here we do a mathf.minimum to prevent the value from exceeding actual cooldown, so that if we call this function multiple times, it won't get the cooldown to, to raise to a very high value. It's just a fail safe over here to prevent bugs from happening if let's say we accidentally call this function too many times. So what, what I'm trying to say here is that once we create this function, it's going to be very easy for us to activate the cooldown of any weapon. And this activation is not going to cause the cooldown of the weapon to jump to very high values when you call this too many times. Okay, so once we have this function inside here, we are going to just add activate cooldown into the attack function. And we also call activate cooldown in the beginning because we set the cooldown value, right? So we replace this. So anytime we are manipulating current cooldown, we replace that with activate cooldown. <clears throat> and then uh, let's go on to uh, the other weapon. So because a lot of our weapons handle their own attack, they also handle their own cooldown, so we cannot just update the weapon script. We also have to go to our projectile weapon, to our lightning moon weapon, and etc. etc. And then just get all the scripts inside there updated as well. And the last weapon is the Aura. Okay, the Aura itself handles cooldowns as well, so we have to make sure to update the Aura with the new cooldown values. So how the Aura works is essentially we just find the part where the cooldown is set. Okay, so we have two paths over here. Either we do this, or we can just access Aura directly because the Aura is a, a weapon effect. So weapon effects already have a reference to the player stats, so we don't have to go through the weapon to get to the Aura. We can, but we don't have to. So what I'm gonna do is just to maintain parity with the projectiles and you know with, with the weapons and everything because all the owners are always capital O, right? I'm just gonna create a getter as well with a capital O for the owner. So we update the aura to also apply the cooldown bonuses and then that finishes it up for the cooldown stat. Okay, so we have one more stat. So we, ha we have an area stat as well. And for the area stat, what we're gonna do is uh, just like under the weapon script, right, we had a get damage function that calculated how much damage uh, the weapon dealt, and then we take into account the player's mind. So here, just add a new add uh, get area function, and we've got to make sure that it's virtual because it's overridable. And then after that, it's just a matter of going to our weapons and then updating the weapons to not use current stats dot area instead to use get area, which factors in the user's stats as well.
And that's about it. So before we wrap up this part, right, let's look at a couple of code optimizations. Actually, just one optimization, right? So if we look at our existing code base, right, uh, you will find that, okay, if you go to weapon dot initialize, right, I was, I, I figured, I realized this when I was, when I was working on this part. And uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to print the weapon's name so that I know which weapon is initializing whenever I play the game. Okay, so you'll find this function will fire twice. Okay, so if I play the game, uh, you'll find that two messages print when the weapon starts up. This means that whenever I add a weapon, this weapon's initialize function fires twice. It's only supposed to fire once. Okay, if it fires twice, it's, a, it's just a redundant, right? So I looked into why this was happening, and it was happening because the start function initializes the weapon. But if you go to the play inventory script, right, you will find that it also initializes the weapon. So we are initializing the weapon twice because there was an oversight on my part when I was calling this system. So the initialization is actually inside the add function right here okay so the weapon is whatever weapon that we have is initialized twice but if we remove any one of the lines right this will actually create errors so if i remove the start function over here it actually causes errors you see i get a whole bunch of now reference exceptions basically when you initialize the weapon right the weapon has certain important variables that are set if the variables are not set then the code doesn't run properly okay so i figured out that the, the fix was actually to if you go to weapon inventory here right okay if or rather if you go to the weapon over here the weapon when it initializes it will look to its parent to find something called player movement all right so whenever we call initialize the object has to have a parent otherwise the movement variable will not be set okay so if you look at play inventory over here it's just one minor problem okay we initialize the weapon before we set a parent to the weapon so we just have to move initialize down a couple of lines. Okay, but if you move initialize below here, then you can remove the start function and the awake function because both of them are not needed. The awake function assigns the current stats, but the current stats are already assigned inside initialize. Next stat display, you may want to also show the health of your character. So I'm going to show you how you can modify your code so that the health of the character appears first on the box and then you also get this extra field here that allows you to check or uncheck to display or not display the character's current health. So First, of course, adding the adding the variable here is pretty simple. You just declare a public boolean, display current health. And once you do that, let's scroll down to update stats views. So this is where the stats are rendered, right? So we just got to add an extra little chunk over here that looks like this. So you check whether display current health, the boolean is true. And if it's true, you append, before you append any of the other fields, the other stats, you append health under the name variable. And under the values variable, you append just the player's current health and then convert it to a string. So if there are any other stats that you want to add in your game, you can just follow the same procedure. Just add the stat name and then followed by the the, the place that you retrieve the stat from, provided the stat isn't inside your character data stats struct. So that's about it really. It's a pretty simple change. Okay, so whatever value you have, is if it's numerical, you, you will have to do a dot to a string to convert it to a string before you can put it into a string builder. And this is the result of what you will have. So what you will have is that in your game, if you access your UI stat display, you will find an extra variable here if you check this. And if I were to select the UI stat display over here, okay, there will be extra health stat over here. And that's about it. So this is just a pretty simple edit that some of you may want to make. Okay, again, if I disable display current health, it doesn't show up. If I check this, it shows up. Okay, so yeah, that's it. So now all the stats are implemented and, and our code is optimized as well. So, okay, so let me just increase. Let's say if I increase the area, what this will do is this will cause the projectiles to become bigger. If I increase the mine, of course it deals a lot of damage, but it's not visible. If I increase the move speed, then it will cause the character to move faster. If I increase the amount, this will give me a lot of projectiles. 
Okay, it's pretty cool. And then if I decrease the cooldown, then this will cause the weapons to fire faster. So we really have a very nice weapon system that's working pretty well right now. So once you get this system up, you can play around with the settings and everything and you can see all your weapons go on steroids, uh, become extremely big, extremely small, whatever you want to do to your weapons, alright? So, very cool stuff. So that's all we have for part 18. With that done, that's about it. You can also create new passive weapons to test out the stats. We've made a couple of passive items in the past few videos okay but you can make more so if you want to make more you can just refer to the vampire survivors wiki and then just grab the stats if you want to have all these weapons set up for you you can download the project files in our patreon and all the weapons will be accessible to you remember to just add the weapons to the play inventory section when you finish the weapon so now that we've got all the stats set up and we have a weapon system that pretty much is ready to go the next thing that I'll be moving on to in the next part So there are two things uh, we want to move into First is the tile spawning We want to make this more robust And second, I think more importantly is the enemy spawning system Right now there is a spawning system, it works Okay, but it can be better Thanks for dropping in as usual Have a good weekend Bye bye